The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Short Time Wrestling Podcast, continuing our financial education segment. Last episode, we talked with Jarrett Yalen, a financial advisor for Northwestern Mutual up here in Minnesota. You can find out things that you need to know about saving and planning your future at mattalkonline.com slash JPY. Yes, that is his initials. And yes, I went to high school with Jarrett Yalen. Our guest today is Lindsay Beasley. She is the wife of George Mason head coach Frank Beasley and a certified public accountant. Today, she will be answering questions about taxes and how we can do things in regards to the world of wrestling, coaches, clinics, camps, side hustles, T-shirts, you name it. Lindsay, welcome to the program. Thank you. So we've been following each other on, on Twitter, and I'm seeing the pictures of the kids because as we get older, you know, things become more prevalent in our timelines. It's no longer like, oh, man, I went out and did this last night to like, hey, look, at my, it's the first day of school. What has yeah. what has motherhood been like for you as the wife of a college wrestling coach? Um, it's it's chaos. You know, I spend a lot of time single momming it, but it's it's good. Um, my kids are very adaptable and they go with the flow, and we are very fortunate in that regard. So, and how old are the the kids now? Um, my son, Franklin, he'll be five in December and my daughter will be two in December. They have the same birthday, coincidentally. So. They're born on the, the same day. Years. Same day. I have one other friend that has two boys that were born on the same day. I think they're two years apart and they're from Pennsylvania too. Go figure. Nice. <laughs> so speaking of Pennsylvania, before we get into the tax stuff, because tax stuff is so exciting for wrestling people, but. You're an expert Rhythm. in this field. At least we're going to call you an expert. At least the closest thing we're going to have for that on this show. But you're from Pennsylvania. You've got a, you, you come from a wrestling family, which I didn't actually really discover until like, oh, I don't know, an hour before we started. But uh, yeah. been, been around wrestling a long time. Just a little, little backstory on uh, where wrestling entered your life before even getting married. Um, so Matt Snyder is my brother. Um, he started wrestling when he was uh, just about five years old. He wasn't that great at wrestling until he got into the later parts of junior high. So I spent a lot of weekends in the car, silent car rides home and, um, and just, you know, it, it was great. He, he transitioned, he started going to a lot more camps and whatever, and got a lot better. And, you know, I was there for the ride the whole time and sometimes a little more vocal than I think he or anyone in my family would prefer that I be. And especially my husband <laughs> prefer that I be, he told me on more than one occasion, people know we're together. <laughs> so, um, yeah, wrestling's been in my life since 1995 ish. And, um, it's been, it's been good. And that part of Pennsylvania wrestling, you know, very, very strong. And also, I mean, you, you know, I sit there and I'm making the connection with Matt now and I'm, that means you got to make the connection with the late Wayne danger. What a guy that guy was. Yes. Oh, he was such such a nice man. Yeah. Great guy. He he did a lot of great things in my community for for wrestling. Now as we we move around, Frank's told the story about how you guys started dating. And again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the Beasley family tree here. <laughs> but it it is kind of interesting that uh, you know, he started looking at jobs before even conferring with you. Explain give give me your side of the story on that whole uh life of a wrestling coach and what's it like to be the then girlfriend? Well, that I, I um, you can probably assume that only happened once but <laughs> he did it before he didn't tell me. Um, no, we were dating and um, it was my senior year at Bloomsburg and he came into my office. I worked in the human resources office for the university, just kind of like as a receptionist and, came in and it was a Wednesday and he was like, um, I'm going to move to Buffalo. And I was like, okay, that, that happened. <laughs> so he moved on Saturday or Sunday of that week and we were long distance. Um, I, I did tell him I wouldn't move until we were engaged. So we were long distance until I passed my CPA exam for about two years after that. 
And then before he applied for any other jobs, there was a discussion. <laughs> yes, but before he re- rebounded and went to out. Binghamton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so looking at the map, about four hours there. That was that's a that's a four hour long distance. My wife and I went uh, about four twelve to fourteen hours. She was in Minnesota, and I'm in Colorado. Our entire first year of marriage. So, yeah, that's rough. That's rough. Yeah, yeah. Although I will say that I was mar- when I the whole first year I saw Abby probably seven days a month, and I had this night. We had this townhouse near USA Wrestling. I could walk five minutes to work or take a thirty seven second drive. It was like. Man, I'm married, but I have this house. This is cool. Anyway, this, this, <laughs> yeah. So long distance is is interesting, especially when you're you're moving, and now you've got kids underfoot, and two. You know, when you add another, um, you know, it just adds to the chaos. So when we get it to definitely does. <laughs> well, first of all, what what drew what what first uh, kind of interested you in the accounting world? Um, truthfully, I wanted to. I thought I had always intended to be an attorney, and I actually ultimately wanted to end up. Um, being like a sports agent. And I uh, was advised in high school that just majoring in pre-law was not wise. So I majored in accounting and then I ended up double majoring in finance as well. And I decided I was, I had enough school. So (laughs) there was no more after that. Um, And being an accountant, honestly, like for this life that we have, it works really well because there are always people in need of accountants. <laughs> so when we move from place to place, it's never really been that difficult for me to find something at least to get my foot, you know, to get moved anyway, even if I'm not 100% happy at that place, you know, at least everybody needs an accountant. So. <laughs> and as far as our topics today, we're going to do our best not to uh, explain maybe the uh personal situations you guys have gone through with some of these scenarios that I've tried out, but obviously some of people might be able to connect the dots and there is some experience Mm -hmm. there as the do as I say, not as I do doesn't always work. No, we've done this. (laughs) Listen to us. And because Frank has actually covered a couple of these bases on these scenarios uh, that we're going to go through. But uh, first things first, when we get to the the wonderful world of taxes and numbers, the first things first is paying taxes sucks. Everybody hates it. I can't stand it, especially when it hits in this time of year, September. It's like, ah, and the quick turnaround. But if there are some general tips that you had before even getting started with filing, if you're in the sport of wrestling, what do you think they would be? Um, you know, one of the biggest things that I see in terms of the sport of wrestling, and I assume other sports as well, is that a lot of people are paid as independent contractors. So they're getting 1099 at the end of the year from every school where they did a camp or, you know, every club that they worked for. Um, And I think a lot of people see that like, oh, here's $1,500 for your time. And then they think that that's all their money. When in reality, I would advise, you know, every situation is different. Every state has higher and lower no income tax, but 30%, like if you're getting a check and you're not an employee and you're not having taxes taken out, um, Take 30% of that check and just put it somewhere where you're not going to look at it. And once a quarter, maybe send some money into the government. <laughs> and, and it's funny you mentioned that because some places you'll get a check and they won't, there won't be a paper trail to follow it. There won't be a tent or there won't be, you know, that nice little square rectangular tax right. that comes in that says, you know, I have, re- I have been paid $1,200 for this amount of year. Uh, some places mm-hmm. don't, don't necessarily uh, file that stuff in. Uh, is there a common misconception is like, well, if there's, you know, they don't report it, you don't have to report it. Well, that's not, that's not the ethical response. <laughs> um, technically, anytime you're getting paid, you should report it. Honestly, even if it's cash, um, businesses aren't required to spend a 1099 if you are paid less than $600 by them for the entire year, not at a time, just in, in total, if you've been paid less than $600, they aren't required to issue a, issue a 1099. You should still claim that income. Um, whether you do or not, that's on you. <laughs> um, and, and then some businesses, you know, they, they don't file their 1099s and then they are subsequently fined by the IRS for not doing that. But, you know, even if you don't get a 1099, you should report the income. I'm also going to say there have been times in my career in this wonderful world of, of freelance that I have been paid five hundred and ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents. 
<laughs> not going to lie. So uh, that being out there now, what are some things that you often see that are left out of tax filings, whether it be uh, John Q. Public or a wrestling coach? Um, uh, I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, for those 1099 expenses, if, if you're doing, if you're a recent graduate and you're doing camps for the summer, you know, maybe you bring in $5,000 and you don't track any of your expenses on that. Um, so you get to the end of the year and, and you go to file and, you know, the government wants X number of dollars from you and you're like, oh, you know, that sucks, but you don't know that maybe you could deduct the flight that you paid for to get to that camp or the mileage that you drove to get there or the hotel that you paid for or the meals, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think, I think a lot of people don't track enough of their expenses. I think they give the government a little more than they need to. And and what can you deduct in terms of expenses? I know that mileage can come out, but it's not all the mileage or is it not all the food? What's an easy way to figure out what you can probably deduct and how much? Um, you can deduct your mileage. So if you're driving, you cannot, you cannot deduct commuting miles. So if you're a volunteer coach and you work at George Mason University, but you live 30 miles away, your mileage to and from school every day, you can't deduct that. But if you are driving to a camp in Virginia Beach, you can track your miles. And there are apps that do this. I, I don't have much familiar, familiarity with any of them, but I know that there are apps that will track your miles. Um, and you can deduct, it changes every year. It's roughly 55 cents a mile, um, from their income that you're paid. What I personally do is I just track all of our trips for the year in a list or Frank's trips for the year. Um, and then I'll go in when I'm prepping everything for our taxes and I'll just Google maps, you know, and get the mileage and do the math that way. Um, I don't think I had enough to keep track of the miles or, and he certainly is not going to utilize an app <laughs> so not even worth the discussion honestly and one thing to consider too is if you're get, are you get uh, you know when when you're getting reimbursed okay are you getting reimbursed for the gas are you getting reimbursed for miles there's right. the, you can't you can't claim them both and also one thing to check on too is i might i might be throwing my former employer under the bus here a little bit but uh at usa wrestling their mileage rate was different they were they were nonprofit, and there's there's different companies that can provide mm-hmm. different rates for for freelancers. So in some cases, it you might want to check that it is it going to be the full fifty four and a half. And if they're reimbursing you for that, there's still that fifteen and change you can still still deduct as well, even though you know it, right. it's the difference. Right. Yeah, you can you can deduct up to the maximum. So whether you know if they're if you're getting reimbursed for thirty cents a mile, make sure you take the other twenty five or whatever. And then meals the meals you are able to deduct 50 percent um but again that's not like if you're a 1099 volunteer coach you can't you know go to jimmy john's and deduct your lunch on a wednesday but if you're out you know on the road somewhere you can deduct your dinner or your whatever um so things in your day-to-day not deductible but anything that that's related to um the income that you're receiving as from on that 1099 is deductible. Um, and even, you know, like if you want to deduct a certain, you know, you use your cell phone 10% for running your camp or for running your club and you want to take 10% of your cell phone bill, like that's perfectly fine. Um, there are a lot of, it depends when it comes to these questions, but generally, you know, mileage, meals, um, portion of your cell phone, things like that. Um, you know, some, if you, if you're paying health insurance out of pocket, um, a lot of, a lot of clubs and schools paying their volunteers and, you know, they're not offering benefits or anything. So certainly deduct that if you're buying insurance on your own. One thing about deductions too, is that's one thing to consider is, I've learned through my travels is I've used what was typically with the IRS rate. I'd look it up to see what what the allowable per diem, I guess, rate would be per yeah. city. So Vegas is infinitely higher than Fargo. And so right. you also got, you know, I've found that that's easier for me than deducting every single receipt, 
even though I can log it with, say, FreshBooks or I use my 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 company uh, bank account, mm-hmm. for example. But uh, you know, what's one thing to consider when when making you know filing your taxes? Are you gonna you gonna take the per diem rate, the federal rate, or are you gonna take the individualized receipts? It's really, I mean, that's really a a personal. You know, if you don't want to track your receipts, and if you take the per diem, you know, I I don't think I don't think the IRS is gonna come back at you and say, well, you know. We shouldn't have taken, you know, that, that's why they're out there. The tables are out there for a reason so that you can use them. And, you know, they are skewed that way so that if you don't have receipts, you know, you're getting a better, you're not, you're not getting taken advantage of by the government, basically, for going to, to Vegas versus Fargo. You know, they have different rates for different places, um, which, which is a good thing. And um, that also applies overseas as well. Different countries have different per diem rates for any you know, athletes who are doing a lot of international travel. Yes, as I'm heading to the Junior World Championships later this week in Slovakia, so I'm I'm looking up the rates, be like, okay, what can I be, what can I be writing off here compared to, you know, when I go to Budapest? And it, it, what's interesting is some cities you think that are that are rich and, and extravagant in some places like have really inexpensive food so it's like you're mm-hmm. looking at it going well that per diem write offs really going to help me here especially come <laughs> next time when we talk yeah. about write offs and do do more of those things we've talked about mileage and cell phone like i work from home so you know there's a certain part of this I, it's a home office so uh, mm-hmm. you got to be careful with write offs though because is there anything that you know that would be kind of a trigger for an audit i know everybody's fearing an audit for example if they got to do it. Got to do it right, or they're or they're even just fl- uh, you know flouting their nose at it, going, "Nah, it's, I'm too small time to, to to even have pay attention to me for an audit." But uh, why is it important to to pay attention to what you're writing off and how you're writing it off? Well, I will say, um, home office is a big target area. Um, so any any time you're deducting, um, excuse me, home office expenses, it is very important to make sure that they are rock solid because. I think that's an area that the IRS has has realized people really take advantage of and um, has become a growing audit concern. So if you are, um, you know, if you live in just for ease of math, you have a thousand square foot house and you have 50 square feet that you're using as office space, it does need to be a designated office space. It can't be, you know, well, here's a table in the corner of my living room that's my office. you can take that percentage and deduct, you know, portions of your real estate taxes and your utilities and your homeowner's insurance and all of that, which really does add up um, and is beneficial. It is just an area that the IRS likes to double check the math on for more, more people than I think, I think you would realize. So So what you're saying is I should be careful with dual use space because I, (laughs) I am planning on building a studio here in, and I've got an unfinished part of the basement here, which is actually right behind where this office sits and it's Minnesota. So we mm-hmm. all have basements. It's not like I'm podcasting from my basement. Well, yeah, I am, but it's a finished basement except for the part right. behind me. So I'm planning on building a studio bar slash standing desk that can <laughs> double as entertain, you know? Yeah. So I got a, hmm, something to, to, to consider there. So now we went through a couple scenarios with Jared Yalen on the, a financial planning episode. We're going to go through some of those same scenarios now and, and kind of give us some advice because as uh, as you, people might be aware that Frank Beasley's career was circuitous before getting a head coaching position. So in some of these mm-hmm. particular uh, pay scales of, of assistant coaches are vastly different than the others. Uh, I guess the same can be said for division one head coaches as well, but we won't quite go there yet. <laughs> um, so let's, let's start with uh, scenarios that you can get maybe some help as a tax professional, somebody that they need to be, be prepared for. If you're a volunteer assistant coach, you have no official salary from the school, you work camps and clinics, and you may be training to, to, to make a senior level team. Say you're number six guy on the ladder. You're not getting any USA wrestling funds. If you're going on a trip, you got a Canada cup, for example, you're paying that out of your pocket. What are some things that they, those people need to be aware of when it comes to be tax season? Um, definitely keep track of, of those travel expenses, especially if you're paying them out of pocket because you're going to be able to deduct those. And um, you, you might even have a loss, you know what I mean? And then you're not, you're not paying tax on any income and you don't owe Uncle Sam anything. 
Um, but as far as any income that you are receiving, um, that 30% is a, is a pretty safe marker for what you want to be setting aside just in case, because the last thing that anybody wants is for April 15th or October 15th or whatever to roll around and all of a sudden you owe the government $3,000 and you're like, ugh, crap, you know? So I think the 30% threshold um, for saving on your income and then just tracking tracking those expenses. And at, when you get to the end of the year, it's always better to track too many than not enough. Um, you know, and you go to your tax preparer and they say, well, you can't deduct X. It's better for that situation to occur than for them to say, okay, well, what did you, how far, how many miles did you drive this year? And then you're like, you're in the headlights. Like, I have no idea. So. I'm going to use this example <laughs> too, that, that threw me for a loop. And this is, this also can kind of serve as, as a media professional. I, as you mentioned earlier, some people get hired as independent contractors. I was when I first moved out here for the wrestling 411 year. And when tax time came around, I thought it was okay. I'm going to say I, at the time I was thinking 25%. Okay, I'm pulling it out and then bills pile up. And then I've got a house that is sitting empty in Pennsylvania that I'm trying to rent out, that I'm paying out, you know, rent in Minnesota, a mortgage in Pennsylvania. Then you're sitting there, you realize your money runs out. And then, well, I bought a computer throughout the course of the day. I remember going to my tax person. like, okay, you're good. I says, uh, no, I have 20 four more thousand dollars of income that I need. To she just looked at me like, <laughs> what? You know? So, um, yeah. So be aware that when you take a job, are you going to be an independent contractor or are you going to be an employee? And, oh man, that was, that was an interesting lesson in taxes the hard way too. Now, uh, as, as I'm kind of inter, inter interjecting here between points A and B is I file quarterly because, you know, the income is sporadic. So is there any benefit for a, a coach or an athlete to file quarterly or wait till April? Um, I mean, technically, if you have, if you're having substantial 1099 income, the, the correct rule of law is to pay in quarterly. Um, most people don't do that. Uh, the risk of not doing that is if you get to April 15th when you file. Um, so the, the difference is you're either you're paying in, you're not really filing quarterly. What you're doing is you're just paying estimate, making estimated tax payments. So you think, you know, somebody tells you at the beginning of the year, you might owe $5,000 on April 15th. So you should pay twelve fifty a quarter. So you should pay twelve fifty a quarter so that when April comes around, if you owe $5,000, you're not also paying a penalty for underpaying throughout the year because the government will do that to you. <laughs> Yay, government stuff. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we've got any listeners who actually work for the IRS who's going to sit there and flip out. <laughs> We'd love to have you on the show to talk about the other. No, okay. Now, uh, another thing about uh, the filing quarterly is, uh, you know, is it is it safer or is it is it just more or less a convenience thing that people opt to not do that? It's more of a convenience thing. And, you know, at the end of the day, Everybody likes to get a giant refund in April, but the goal should be to get nothing and to pay nothing, you know? So it's more of a timing thing. Like, ideally, you want to come out at zero in April. I personally would prefer to get a bigger refund. So we do all the things and over withhold and all of that. Um, but the other side is, is you could get stuck with owing a lot of money in April if you're not like consciously thinking about it throughout the year and like, oh, you get, you know, $2,000, maybe you just send 500 in um, to the IRS just to be safe. And then you've already parted with the money. And if you get it back, fine. If you don't, fine. Now, one thing I, I, I this wasn't in kind of our, our, our four point outline in terms of scenarios, but I also want to bring up a scenario that in turn, that's a very real one. And it is, it is basically, it doesn't matter which gender you are in terms of uh, you getting married is, is filing separate or filing joint. And the situation, whereas say, say your significant other, you got married and they make a crap ton of money. And all of a sudden you're jumping tax brackets and things of that nature. What's something to consider when, when getting married and one, one person of the, uh, the, the dynamic, uh, makes significantly more than the other in terms of filing taxes? Um, that is really a very, very situational. Like every single one of those, those cases is very different. Um, I personally, in my time as a public accountant, did not see a lot of married filing separate. And I've seen my fair share of 
very high net worth individuals. And I, I think the majority of the people it's filed jointly. And because, I mean, honestly, oftentimes if one spouse is making so significantly more money than the other, that spouse probably isn't earning any income anyway. So filing separately is irrelevant. Yeah, it's not like, well, I only made, I only talk, took home 20 grand this year on camps and you make six figures. It uh, doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a hint to wrestling coaches. Mary. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, moving, <laughs> moving to point B, whether you be a, men, a men's coach or a women's coach, paid assistant coach doing the same thing as above, you know, working camps and clinics, but on the books with the school and having taxes taken out. With now you're getting to that situation where you've got money being taken out by your employer, but you're also get got this little side hustle going. Uh, mm-hmm. The balance of reporting, the balance of write offs. Say you're 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 using your you've got a, you're leaving a, a an event, and then you're going to work a camp afterwards, and you got to make sure which miles that you're deducting are you know are they covered by your full time employer or are they on mm-hmm. your own? Yeah, and and really that the biggest key to situations like this where um you know i will i will just speak from experience this is just the easiest way for me to illustrate this point um it's just tracking everything separately is key you know like for instance if frank's going to recruit somewhere and he's getting reimbursed that mileage to and from a state tournament by the university but then he's also going from that state tournament to a club to work for four days well then that and that has to be tracked separately you know like you're not getting reimbursed for that mileage and you're not getting reimbursed for that hotel stay and those meals um and that's all just important to know what your what expenses you're tracking for because you maybe get reimbursed for, ugh, excuse me reimbursed for some and not for others um and then as far as like withholding and all of that, you're, if you're withholding a little bit more than the IRS tables, you know, like when you go and you're like, okay, well, here's my income and here are my deductions, and, you know, or my um, exemptions. If you're withholding a little bit more than you need to, you probably don't need to be worried about what you're going to owe at the end of the year unless you're, you know, making an extra $25,000 plus thousand a year. Now move into scenario C, which is a, a lot of this country's coaches, because you know there's there's a lot more high school wrestling programs, obviously, than there are college wrestling programs. But say high school coach, he's a teacher, you get the extra stipend as a coach, thinking about or has an off season club, has summer camps, and, and travels uh, a lot during the summertime that doesn't have anything related to their their school job. What, what's the best course of action in terms of uh, setting money aside or, or, or filing for for the, the high school teacher that is very active in say their their USA wrestling chapter during the summertime. Um again, I I think that they don't need to to worry so much about saving, you know, they certainly probably don't need to worry about saving that 30% because they're already, you know, they're having their federal and all of their social security and all that already withheld. Um it's just going to be about tracking the expenses and um making sure that you know, you have all your ducks in a row in that way. Is there anything that, that differs for when somebody sets out on their own? Say, you know, this is the last scenario that we've we've talked about. Say you're 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 an independent club owner, you've started a club, you've got your own facility, you've got your own space, everything you're paying, everything out of pocket, you've got, you know, kind of almost a subscription based type of uh monthly income that's coming in. Anything that that, that type of scenario should do differently or than than the other three we've gone over? Yeah, that in that situation, you'll definitely um, register your um, your business with your state, with your local taxing authorities, and um, you know we can get into LLCs versus S corps, but um, you just you want to make sure that you're incorporated in some way. And um, personally, you know, I would recommend an LLC or, or an S corp to just get that legal protection around you as a, as an official company. And so that your personal assets aren't at risk. Yeah. Say so some, much. say somebody gets hurt at the club and you know, you get sued Well, they can, you know, they take, yeah. the club, they take the club assets, your business assets, but uh, then you're not sitting out there with no house. 
Exactly, because you're you're inherently going to have some kind of insurance, some kind of business insurance to protect yourself. Um, and yes, you're not, you know, not, nobody's taking food off your table if something should happen. So that's that's the biggest. You you are a business if you are that situation, and you operate like a business. We did get a couple questions as I put this out on Twitter about uh, a month or so ago when uh, when I was going to have Jared on the show and a couple things came back and they all kind of were about the same thing although you did kind of touch on the LLC well I'll, I'll go a little more in depth in that in a little bit but uh the difference is when you end up going nonprofit 501c3 uh, I, you know uh, mm-hmm. Gardner Wheeler asked this question he's at GX wheel 152 uh one item we've looked at is converting our club over to a state level nonprofit uh, but there are quite a few administrative and financial hurdles, uh, not to mention, would it still be a 501c3? Any any tax advice for somebody that wants to take their club nonprofit? So um, states states aren't able, the IRS issues a, non, a nonprofit status. So what you, I mean, I assume this club is already incorporated in some way, so they would file a form, it's form 1023, for anyone who's super into looking at IRS forms. Um, Form 1023 will um, help is what you filed to get a nonprofit status, and that's with the IRS. Um, and then different states have different filing requirements as well, but the official nonprofit status comes from the IRS. Yes, and I, I know from uh, helping found the Virginia Challenge years ago, we had, you know, in a lot of those cases, you got to have a formation of a board, you got to have articles mm-hmm. of incorporation, articles. all sorts of stuff. <laughs> that- yes. That could it's, be a whole nother episode. It's a lofty process, but um, I mean, honestly, the the benef- I mean, there are benefits outweigh the initial burden of all the paperwork, you know, of being a tax exempt entity. So, all right, one of my my Virginia folks, uh, Coach Alexander Santos, uh, asks us: How does having a five hundred one c three affect those personal deductions and write offs? Is it better to put that uh, under the under the charity or the nonprofit or under yourself? Well, they are two entirely different things. So anything that any expense that's related to you personally and is not to be run through your 501c3. Um, everything that's run through the nonprofit should in some way relate to the state admission of the nonprofit that's on the record. Um, so, you know, if you're ordering T-shirts for your club, that's a fine, that's an okay expense. If you're picking up Starbucks on your way to club practice, no, you know, that's on you. So or or in a situation just, where, say you're in Fargo, you're buying 100 subs for your team versus uh, going out to dinner after the tournament by yourself. Exactly, exactly. One is perfectly permissible, one is not. <laughs> and, and, I, and I throw that one out there because after the tournament, because if, if you're on a trip and you're traveling, pretty much everything, you know, if you're a coach and you say you got a nonprofit, pretty much everything there should fall under the club stuff because it's like, what, what do they expect you not to eat while you're traveling? Yeah, and that's one of those situations where, you know, I think it can go either way. But for purposes of not getting super specific about situations. Right, right. <laughs> All right, and our friends up at Blood Round, Kevin Clonch at Clotchinator, uh, he, he, he prefaced this by saying, asking for a friend. Uh, when someone sets up an <laughs> LLC, whether it be for church or camp system, then what? And I guess that goes into the discussion of LLC or S corp. I mean, I've got these same questions too, as it as it involves to to you know this this company with Matt Talk Online in terms of LLC or S corp, the differences, tax benefits of each. I mean, obviously, it's again situational and, and somewhat specific to the the type of company, but you know, general overview of what those two things mean and what they could mean for taxes and people having their own business? So um, an LLC will provide, both will provide you legal protection, um, officially incorporating with your state. Um, the difference is there are, there are certain tax benefits to being an S-corp. Um, and that's kind of the second step. Once you, once you establish a legal entity, then you can become, then you can also file to be an S-corp. And so the easiest example I can give is if you're um, if you're an LLC and you have $100,000 in profit showing on your tax return, you are going to pay um, Social Security and Medicare taxes on that $100,000. Um, 
But if you're an S corp and you have, you know, the, the S corp is paying those taxes, you're not paying them. Um, you're and you're taking a salary from your S corp of fifty thousand dollars. You're only paying Social Security and Medicare tax on that fifty thousand dollars. You're not paying it on the whole profit of your company. Does that make sense? Ah, got you. And if you don't make any profit. <laughs> you don't pay anything which uh, um fun fact is for 2018 everyone who whether you know you're a schedule c or llc or whatever you are if you have money coming through on that pass-through line everyone now gets 20 percent deduction off the top uh, without even having to do anything <laughs> so. there's another thing that also uh again just popped into my head as i, I, I talked about the wrestling 411 thing a bit ago and that was when i moved to minnesota I got hit at tax season with, you know, because I had I'd filed a business license down with the, the Secretary of State, you know, went down to the state capitol and did all that stuff. And tax time, we get hit with the 15% self-employment tax. That's something people also need to consider. Some localities have that type of thing. Right. Yeah, it's very important to know what your specific state taxes. Um, personally, in Virginia, vehicle taxes. Ah, yes. Personal <laughs> property tax. I loved that when I lived there. Yeah, we we just received ours for six months in there. Super. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's important to look into those things, especially, you know, when you're just starting up your company or you move to a new state, because certainly Pennsylvania and Minnesota and Virginia, they all tax in different ways. So. Yeah, and those are three states that I've lived in. So I, I and, and that actually kind of goes to another point is too is uh, when you move and wrestling coaches are transient beings. You can sometimes probably have somebody that in a, in a given tax year is has been paid more than six hundred dollars in more than one state, and mm -hmm. trying to file this type of thing through TurboTax, for example, uh, I know that's a, a program that is obviously the most popular for people to file their own taxes, but. Uh, you know, when I moved to Colorado, my wife and I had to file in Colorado because we live there, Minnesota because she worked there technically and still had property there, and Pennsylvania where I still had a house. And, mm -hmm. you know, filing three – oh, man, it was more paperwork and just be be expected to uh, to pay for those things if you've got property or have worked in different states. Yes, absolutely. Um, you – and again, this is a – varying states have varying thresholds, but um, – you may or may not be required to pay taxes in every state for what you earn income from what you earn in, in income. So beware <laughs> if you're doing camps all over the country that you may end up paying hefty fees to file in multiple states. I will also say from my own personal experiences, and this is not a plug, it's a plug, but it's not a sponsored ad by any means is, uh, is I've been using fresh books for the last couple of years. Cause it, one, it can sync to my 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 debit account with when I'm traveling, I use my business account versus my personal account. And then, you know, that's where mm -hmm. I file all my invoices. So it gives me a nice P&L statement and all sorts. I know my, my tax preparer totally likes the fact that I'm a lot more organized than I was when we first started going there. You know, we moved back here about <laughs> five years ago. Um, I actually once had a, a guy who worked with me at the Daily Press say I was going to be the first guy to make a million dollars with 50,000 1099s. So <laughs> I've always been a treat with the tax people. I can tell you that. now. This also goes to the point and varying degrees of tax professionals. Um, some are more expensive than others. It, you know, I, I think you might be slightly biased in this regard, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. <laughs> is it better for people to, to, to go to a certified public accountant or, or, or then, then do it themselves on TurboTax? Yes. So the, the biggest reason is that TurboTax is designed for people who have very, very simple returns or who have a fair amount of knowledge about the inner workings of what's going on, that they're not going to miss something. Um, you know, I, I'm not in public accounting today, so I'm not trying to <laughs> sell anybody on public accounting, but or using a, a professional, but um, a lot of, a lot of places like the H&R Blocks and the Jackson Hewitt, you know, they're training people for a few days to prep tax returns. And they're great for people who walk in like, 
my my firm, the firms that I worked for, if some if somebody came in with a W two and a, a interest from a savings account, it would be like, you no, know, like we don't, you don't need us basically. Like you're good for TurboTax or you're good for, you know, the shop in the mall. Um, but the co- you know, coaches and anybody who has these little complicated where they have 1099s and they're tracking expenses, it's just better. It's better for you to pay out a little bit of money so somebody can get your total picture and give you the best outcome tax wise. Yeah. So if I, I came in, I remember when we went, we, we had a firm in Colorado when we lived out there and it was like I had all, you know, I worked at USA Wrestling, but I also had uh, the, my side gigs doing some PA announcing and, and things. And now I'm on my, that was, that wasn't so elaborate. But now when I've got, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 clients a year (laughs) all across the world in some cases that, uh, you know, once, you know, keeping just your simple receipts and your mileage and your flights, uh, that's one thing that definitely makes things a lot easier. But having having a certified tax, uh, uh, certified CPA, what is it? Certified public accountant. Yes, that's what that means. Um, Having that really has helped us lessen the load. Now, um, you you brought up H&R Block and, and Jackson Hewitt and. Of course, there's also you know Liberty Tax Service, which actually is a sponsor mm-hmm. of Old Dominion Football. So I'm going to plug them while we're at it. But <laughs> you know, what's something that people off the street maybe not know about these things? And you know, what type of companies are they? They're super busy for like you know four weeks a year. And you know, is is there is there kind of a a stigma about these places, or are they legit? Just like uh, any CPA you'd find. Um, they're they're legitimate tax preparers. They are not. Um, they're not CPAs. They, um, you know, you could apply for a job to work for them and like, you know what I mean? Have, you could have been a teacher or a nurse or a car mechanic or, and you know, whatever, and apply for one of these jobs and get some training and prep taxes. You know what I mean? So you're not getting the expertise of somebody who has, taken an exam and has continued to take educational courses, keep up with current regs, regulations and everything. Um, that's, that's the biggest difference, but it's the end of it. And, and honestly, you're not necessarily paying less going to one of those places. Um, you may be surprised at how affordable a CPA can be, especially if you've paid one of those shops in the past. Now, there's also one thing, I guess, it, it, what you, the lesson there is you do, like anything, get what you pay for. So I know that, yeah. you know, sometimes if you can find that, that honey hole where it's like, whoa, this guy does a great job and he doesn't charge me an arm and a leg and it's legit, <laughs> I'd say stick with that one. But uh, so how would you recommend finding an affordable CPA for somebody that's, again, they may not have three, four hundred dollars to throw at a tax preparer or, or, or CPA in, you know, in their current financial states, but they they still need a little bit more professional help than you know than a Jackson Hewitt or, or something that they can do on their own with TurboTax. Um, you know, I, the best one. Well, I mean, personally, I'll just plug my friend. <laughs> well, Frank and I fight over whose friend he was first, but I'll claim him right now. Frank's not here. Um. My friend Corey has done my taxes for like the past, I don't know, six or seven years just because he's been doing it. And so I just let it, he just keeps doing it rather than transferring information back and forth when we move and whatever. Um, so I'm happy to pass information on about his firm to anybody that might want it. But I mean, honestly, like you just kind of have to make the phone calls and Google and do research and find a place, you know, word of mouth, who's reputable in, in your area and who isn't going to rip you off. Um, you know, because a, a place that's just looking to make money, if, if you come in and you're like, oh, I have all of this and it's so complicated and it's so hard, they're going to feel like they can charge you more. You know what I mean? Because oh, this person really needs help. They have no clue what they're doing. I bet we can charge them $700 and they won't know the difference. Um, you need to, just do your homework and weed places like that out. And also let's, let's not <laughs> understate the importance of word of mouth. If you've got somebody yeah. that raves about their tax professional, talk to them too, because that's, that's how we actually uh, lined ours up in Minnesota. So, uh, you know, friend of the family kind of thing. And sometimes those things actually just work out great. Absolutely. Yeah. It's talking. I mean, it's, you know, it's nerdy and it's, 
sucks and nobody likes paying taxes. <laughs> but ask, ask your friends who who does their tax return and, you know, call them up and see how they can help. Yes, because, yes, wrestling is, is a meathead sport, but we do have our nerds there. So ask the nerds. <laughs> Ask the frugal nerds, okay? They're the ones that are going to be, you know, running the business later on. Find out what they do or what their parents do. That's, uh, you know, you know, imitations the what the finest, the sincerest form of flattery or something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah. mixing all sorts of metaphors and similes and analogies and anecdotes today. So, uh, anyway, Lindsay, any final thoughts about as as we roll through? I know it's it's September 10th, which means for me, I'm I'm got a file before I leave for Slovakia, at least with uh, with the quarterly returns. But anything that you feel that wrestling people, coaches specifically, should really do first to get their their taxes in line, say if they they're in a riz. Um. I'm a, I'm a spreadsheet person, but if you're a notebook person or whatever, make notes in your phone, just start, just track the money in and the money out. So that at the end of the year, whether you're doing it in TurboTax or whether you're paying um, a CPA or a Jackson Hewitt or whatever to do it, you're not spending three days digging through your credit card statements and trying to find receipts. <laughs> I usually do the export from FreshBooks and then I, I categorize it. And it's like, okay, well, that's definitely okay. That was a trip. I look at the dates, like that was trip, that was trip. That's a t-shirt. No, that's a t-shirt. No, that's software. Yes, you know, it depends yeah. on certain things that you can write off. But uh, again, the I, it's just we're talking taxes, which again, again, not the most exciting thing in the world. But at least we're not talking actuarial stuff. So uh, you know, what what's the joke? That's a whole uh, other level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, how, how do you know an actuary has a personality? They're staring at your feet when they talk to you. <laughs> See, my wife worked with an actuary. See, the, the joke is, for those who don't get it, they usually look at their own feet. The, yeah, anyway, my wife told me that joke after she worked for an actuary, worked with an actuary on a on a, on a, 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 a job site when she used to work for Deloitte. It was kind of interesting. So, nice. Anyway, we have uh, all gone off in the weeds about actuarial jokes and giant spreadsheets and pivot tables. But Lindsay Beasley... Thank you very much for your time, and and I just kind of want to clear this up as as we were finishing up with Jerry Allen last time. I mentioned this at the end of the show that I went to high school with a guy named Frank Beasley, but was spelled differently, and he was Jared's soccer teammate. So uh, when I threw the word Frank Beasley at the end of the show, he's like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> it totally threw him for a loop, and I was like, "Man, I didn't even think about that." And of course, every time I see your husband's name, I think back to my my friend from high school. So imagine that small world. <laughs> Yes, and this is one of the few times uh, an Old Dominion monarch and a George Mason patriot will get along on anything. So let that be known. <laughs> there you go. The other times with me, <laughs> me, me and Brian Hazard. So, oh, nice, great guy. So, so, any 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 final tips on where to find this stuff? Should they Google it? Should uh, should they go down the street? Should they find a CPA and walk in? I mean, you know, I guess starting point zero as we close here. Um, starting point zero, honestly, anybody can direct message me on Twitter, can email me. I don't, I don't charge for advice for wrestling people. You know, it's just kind of like, I'm here to help. So, um, you know, if you want help, just like starting getting started, I've made more templates for people to track their expenses and I can count. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to help in any way and direct you. Um, if I can't answer your question, direct you to somebody who can or a website or and she's on twitter at ms beasley cp that's mrs beasley with an s cpa any final thoughts on wrestling frank's abrupt moves fairfax the traffic you know the traffic's not terrible i used to not leave fairfax but now i go to dc twice a week for work um it's it's good. I'm so much closer to my family now. I'm very happy here, and I'm a political nerd and junkie, so I love it. I love the DC area. Yeah, we're not talking about that at all. I hate politics, so you can <laughs> you can take the Northern Virginia traffic and the politics, and you can have it. I'll take my Thank ten thousand lakes and my walleye. <laughs> Lindsay, great talking with you. Very informative. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for Thank coming on the you. show. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, the last two episodes, you have gotten, like, knowledge beyond belief. And it's not exactly the most glamorous part of life, but paying taxes is a reality and saving for your future also a reality. So I'd like to thank our last two guests, Jarrett Yalen from Northwestern Mutual and Lindsay Beasley 
the wife of head wrestling coach at George Mason University, Frank Beasley, for all of their professional insights and opinions on this wrestling topics that impact a large part of the general population, whether you know it impacts me as I own my own company, my own business here. It impacts Coach Beasley as he was coming through as a young coach, as a volunteer, and then as a number two assistant, and as a as a number one assistant, as a head coach. These are the it's it's the lineage of what happens in the sport of wrestling. Whether you be a high school coach uh, and you're a part timer and you get a teaching job, or you're in college and you're that that GA at a at a place, and then you get you know the teaching job you want in your hometown. All sorts of these things. You got to pay attention to your taxes. You got to pay attention to your financial well being beyond just you right now. If you're a single guy or girl coaching, and you know what, you're not worried about twenty years from now. Yeah, you know what? Trust me. It's yeah. You want to worry about what's going on twenty years from now. My kids are young. I want to make sure that they've got some stability as well as uh, my wife and I. So, I'd like to thank again Jarrett and Lindsay for their just tremendous knowledge in the field and how to relate it to the sport of wrestling as a report <laughs> report as I record this on September 10th, 2018, some updates about the site. So let me take a deep breath and stretch. Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. There we go. By the way, congrats on blood round for their 200th episode, 200 profanity laced episodes. Anyway, what we've got here on the almanac page at almanac.mattalkonline.com or the graphic you can see on the front page at mattalkonline.com is the school board. California Community College Wrestling Season has opened up Cerritos College. Yep, Coach Donnie Garriott, those Falcons are out to a 4-0 and start after picking up four wins at the Bakersfield Duels this past weekend. I had a chance to meet Bakersfield Coach Brett Clark over the summer at the NWCA convention. Going to do some California Junior College coverage here on the Short Time Wrestling Podcast after these trips, okay, I've got a trip to Slovakia coming up with the Junior Worlds. I'll be there until September 24th, if I can pull up the, the calendar here on Ye old Mac. Uh, I will land back in the United I leave on the 13th, land on the 14th, and then get back here on the 24th. Then we got a couple weeks before I head to Budapest on October 18th through the 29th. Yeah, a couple long, long trips. And we've signed up my oldest daughter for dance lessons in the meantime. So uh, wife's going to have a lot of fun with some of that stuff. But that being said, California Community College scores are up there. You go to the school board page at mattalkonline.com. You will see the link, the graphic to the school board. That'll take you to all the links and scores that I can find. Not every single California score will be linked in there because a lot of these small junior colleges do not have full sports information staffs. They don't have... The website's up to date because it could be like an assistant soccer coach or something doing, uh, doing the work on the side. It's just, uh, it, it's just what happens with junior college wrestling, whether that be in the California Community Colleges or in the NJCAA. Results in those divisions are notoriously hard to come by. But with twenty some schools in California, doing my best to update their scores and their standings. Of course, John Sachs at the the noted photographer from TechFall.com also runs CACCWrestling.com. So links of all sorts of things there. So the the college school boards are out. I'm building these schedules, and it's been a long time because I've got I'm looking at my to do list for things that we need to do for uh, for the website and things for you, the fans, and things that I'm doing. Update the college teams that I do. I'm going to break out this college teams database, which is free. Uh, all sorts of information you'll be able to find quickly and easily accessible. The college schedules. I got to update our four time All Americans. Got to update all my college hometowns for the D2 and D3 All-Americans. And a lot of that stuff you're hearing me talk about, you're like, you haven't seen it. We're like, yeah, because that is in my like sandbox, my Almanac sandbox that you can get access to by becoming a patron of the Mad Talk Podcast Network. Various degrees of patronage uh, at the dollar level. You know, it's a thank you, a dollar a month. Hey, thanks. I'll send you some stickers. You know, I, I, I you know, I'll lose, lose half of the, uh, <laughs> the revenue right away just sending the stamp your way, but... Uh, $1, $5, $10, $15, $20, whatever you want to contribute monthly will get you a certain level of gear here from the Mad Talk Podcast Network. So a lot of that stuff is also stats oriented. You get all sorts of just the stuff I put together with the preview guide, all that playground, that sandbox of numbers that I pour through and collect and tabulate and break down. You can have access to that too. Just hit the right level of patronage at mattalkonline.com slash join the team. Draft glasses, stocking caps, 
stats, T-shirts, stickers. Yeah. Rocking the Matt Talk. Headphones. Everywhere you go. Anyway, so I'm going to be in Slovakia doing the broadcast for United World Wrestling at the Junior World Championship. So I will also have episodes of Inside Virginia Tech Wrestling. I will have episodes of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. I will have episodes of the World Wrestling Resource Podcast. All of those coming in the next 13 days. So I am going to be out of, overseas, out of pocket, doing what I can, though, with that daily wrestling newsletter. Well over 1,000 people, man. That thing is just rolling now. That is free every single morning. And with the time difference, I'm probably going to be able to do that in the middle of the day over there, and it still be normal time over here. One last thing I want to say about uh, the world of wrestling, and you know, this goes to the Richard Perry thing, which in case you've been uh, under a rock the last couple days, is that uh, Richard Perry, a Bloomsburg alum, which is fitting that we had another Bloomsburg alum on the show today, is that uh, he was seriously injured and is, is you know, in a fight not just for you know, his sight, but a fight for his life. But Andy Hamilton of Track Wrestling wrote a phenomenal story. Just it, it, It's exhibit number 4,000 about why Andy is the best wrestling writer in the game. It, it, it's, 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 it's not close. There's some great wrestling writers out there, but Andy just proves time and time again that he just, just crushed it. Crushed this story, and he actually had it written, ready to go before the injury, and then had to go back and, and you know, Everything back and forth between the story is just it's the best read of the year. Uh, best read of the year. Go to trackwrestling.com and check out the story about Richard Perry and everything he's overcome just to just to have an opportunity to make the national team. And now as he has he's fighting for his life. So that's all I've got for you there. Again, pay attention to what I've got going on in Slovakia the next couple of weeks. And I'd like to thank you, as always, for spending your time with me because you've always got time for short time. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast is proudly outfitted by Compound Clothing. Shirts, singlets, custom gear orders, everything you need. Call up Cliff and the crew at cmpteamwear.com. First time listening? Well, you can change that by going to matttalkonline.com slash get short time to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or listen on your favorite podcatcher at matttalkonline.com slash listen. This show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.